Welcome to the Robotics Through Science Fiction podcast. I'm Robin Murphy, and today we have Elizabeth Baer. Her science fiction has won numerous Hugo Awards, a Locus Award, a Campbell Award, and though most people don't associate her with robotics, her story, Tideline, won the Hugo for the best short story in 2008, and it is one of the top robot stories ever. So thank you, Bear, for being here with us. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Can you summarize Tideline for us? Because I'm always scared that I'm going to like do a spoiler or just kind of ruin it. It's such a beautiful story. Tideline is the touching story of a robot and her boy. <laughs> um, Tideline is a, a story about a war machine, um, a combat robot who is the last survivor of her platoon. And um, she has some uh, experiential learning modules. So she has picked up a lot of skills from the humans that she was uh, assigned to work with. Um, she's, she integrated into the platoon and she learned the social expectations. And as a result, um, after everybody else has died in some unnamed apocalypse, uh, she's, she's damaged, um, she's slowly becoming non-functional, and she's creating a memorial to them, basically out of scraps of things that she finds on a beach. And uh, then she uh, rescues a young man who sort of becomes her protege. Um, and I think that's, there, anything further than that would be spoilers. <laughs> Um, she starts telling him the same stories that she learned her social skills from. Uh, yeah. So yeah, some of which are Arthurian, and there's a there's sort of an a little Arthurian note um, in there because I like Arthurian stuff, and it's also sort of our societal touchstone for stories about the cost of war. Um, or one of our societal touchstones, perhaps I should say our oldest societal touchstone for stories about the cost of war. Uh, so it seemed an appropriate thematic element to work in there. Well, and from an AI point, I hadn't really thought about it, but you're also doing a lot of talking. It's, uh, I saw the story as a great illuminating of AI and the idea of teamwork. What does it take mm -hmm. to have a team? And you, you, you know, said ex experiential learning, which is learning from experience, which is very important. But some of that looked like it was prefabbed or pre, what do you need to give a robot to have a common ground with mm -hmm. the team members and, and those things. So that that was very, very cool and very sweet the way it was done. And the authorian is both about individuals and working as a team, the round table, and then their individual foibles mm -hmm. and grew ups, but yet they still made something that you know persist. You know, the yeah. thing of legend. And I think there's there's also a thematic element in the story about um, transmission of information through stories and how they get garbled, because the the stories uh, that Calcedony, which is the name of the robot, her interpretation of them is not necessarily the spin that a human would have put on them. And then she passes them on to this young man she rescues and he conflates everything and gets very confused about the difference between the soldiers she actually knew and the soldiers of the round table. Um, I was also thinking about um, the, the other non-human entities we, we bring into war with us, um, dogs and horses in particular and the relationships that people have with, uh, with combat dogs and war horses. Um, and so that sort of informed the way I wrote Calcedony. Yeah, just now, now I'm just thinking sad about war horse and thinking about dogs. Oh, that is the saddest know, movie. <laughs> you know, just kind of like, Okay, this is, but it's, you know, in, in your, your story is a weeper, but it's, it's, you know, that it's a yeah. great, great story. So about the robotics, how do you go yes. about writing a robot story? Because that's a hardcore, it's a robot point of view. Uh, the robot is not a human. We're not doing one of these little Pinocchio things. We're, we're catching, like you said, Kalsini gets some of it right as her own spin, which is 
seems totally reasonable as her own mm -hmm. agent. Did you just make that up? Did you like study books or listen to Wired magazine episodes? I, I read a lot of um, uh, science magazines uh, and science websites. In Scientific American, Popular Mechanics, Discover. Um, and that is mostly how I keep up on uh, scientific advances. Um, I'm not, un unlike many of my colleagues, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a physicist. So I have to come at it from, you know, I, I need it boiled down to intelligent layman levels. <laughs> um, but uh, I also have, uh, I have a fair number of friends who do some sort of a life or robotics research. Friend, I should say friends and acquaintances. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be invited to um, tour the MIT Media Lab a couple of times um, and gotten to talk to some of those folks about what they're doing. And so basically it's just talking with colleagues. Um, and sometimes when I'm writing a story, I will sit down and do directed research. Like I did a bunch of directed research about um, about a life in robotics while I was writing that story, but often the ideas behind it come from, and I wrote the story in 2006, so I'm thinking back, trying to remember, you know, 13 years ago, what was I thinking? Um, I do remember that a lot of the foundation of it was stuff that was just kind of percolating, um, which I think is, is very important for a storyteller to just keep putting stuff into your head because that's the that's the foundation of where where the bases of the narrative come from it make, makes sense and and asking to be an archaeologist of your story <laughs> let, let me cheat and ask you another story another great robot story that you did was was dolly so can uh, and dolly's a sex spot pretty much the opposite spectrum from um uh, from Taiwan. Yeah. can you tell me about that one and what do you remember about writing that? Um, Dolly is a is a very direct response in some ways to Isaac Asimov's uh, robot stories. Um, I mean, it's a murder mystery with a robot in it. Um, and the central question of the the story uh, becomes, is the robot the murderer or is the robot a weapon? Um, in other words, does, does this android have free will? Um, or is it just a box that you put inputs into and get outputs out of? Um, and I am very, I'm very interested in the, the, the question of AI. Um, and the question of, you know, the, the, the famous strong AI, artificial people, basically, of science fiction, um, whether or not that will ever be a reality uh, is, I, I'm not trying to be predictive about that. I'm interested in exploring the implications of both futures with and without that technology. Um, I have I, I enjoy writing artificial intelligences. I they're they're fun, um, but with Dolly, I was both trying to look at what happens when a robot is or is not a murderer, um, you know, and the the whole what what happens if the if you sort of throw the traditional three laws of robotics out the window, um, but also how do you define artificial intelligence? Um, how do you define, how do you determine whether something is um, sapient and sentient as opposed to operating off of algorithms? Um, and that's the, um, the problem that the protagonist of Dolly, who is a, a middle-aged uh, female homicide detective, who uh, has sort of protective motherly feelings about, about this poor abandoned sex bot um, is, uh, is attempting to deal with. 
Oh, I actually just remembered. Um, there's sort of a robot in the book I just finished writing, uh, which is called Machine. There's a, mm -hmm. uh, an unembodied AI. So I guess that counts as a robot. They, they do, and I get into uh, all sorts of arguments with my colleagues about a robot ship, you know, is HAL a robot, you know, I mean, with the physical right. instantiation, is it designed to actually have actions and affect change in the world? Yeah, it's why does only a human body count? <laughs> right, you know, as Kloss is the Forbin project. But going back to Dolly, what, what hmm. I liked about it is that I thought you really set up this spectrum in these two stories of the two most heavily funded applications of robots right now, and that yeah. would be military but actually the most money for ai is actually going into sex bots i was just reading a very interesting article on the next gen sex bots um some of it's really creepy particularly the uh the small child sized ones so uh, i don't know if you've ever done anything with the uh, foundation for responsible robotics and there's some i really, am not uh a couple of uh, Noel Sharkey's been doing that for years. Uh, Amy mm -hmm. Ben Weinsberg is fantastic. There's a woman up in Boston who's doing uh, very interesting studies on these types of things as well. So I will look into that. Yeah. 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 So so Dolly's interesting, you know, with the, the, the idea of the sex bot, and we see that again. We're seeing that in uh, almost human or humans rather and Better Than Us, the new Netflix series, where, mm -hmm. and as well as the HBO West world, is that the, okay, I'm now smart enough to, to be the person you want, which means I'm smart enough to be sick of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the problem. Um, and if you are creating androids so that you don't have to have functional relationships, with give and take in them, so that you can have an abusive relationship with somebody, and then you make them smart enough to appreciate the fact that it's an abusive relationship. Um, how is how, there are moral implications to that? Oh, there are yeah. implications to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think VN looked at that really well. That was it, it was an unpleasant book to oh, read. Oh, um, uh, uh, Ashby. Yeah. Yeah, yes. that was really hard to read because that point of view of seeing it being the victim of that kind of abuse. And what yeah. a neat play on the implications of Asimov's three laws. I didn't see Dolly as an Asimov story per se because it, it was more back to me to the Indo Binder, the original iRobot story, which Adam was on trial for murder, mm -hmm. which turned out he didn't particularly do. I mean, it was an accident. But, you know, Asimov was just so unrelentingly positive about robots, <laughs> right? I mean, that was, that's one of his gifts, right? But, uh, you know, whereas this was a, a tatter on the dark side. Yeah, well, that's why I was saying it's sort of in response to, in argument with, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I shouldn't even say with Asimov stories, like with my memory of the Asimov robot stories that I read when I was in high school and college, as I did not go back and reread the, the oeuvre, as it were. I just sort of got in touch with my inner feelings about those stories, <laughs> which is apparently like, this is way too happy. <laughs> yeah. well, well, speaking of stories, you've got a new collection of stories that's coming out. So can you tell yes. us about those? Um, the collection that's coming out is The Best of Elizabeth Bear, and it is a big, fat tome uh, coming from Subterranean Press. There's a limited edition hardcover, and I believe there's going to be a, a, an ebook um, as well for those who do not wish to pay for the limited edition hard, slipcase hardcover. Um, but that's got, uh, that's got stories from not quite all 15 years of my professional career, but pretty close. Um, and it has it has both of my Hugo winning stories in it, Tideline and uh, Shoggoths in Bloom, mm -hmm. um, and some newer stories that I'm quite proud of uh, as well. Um, I think that off the top, actually, there is there is at least one robot story or virtual. It's sort of a virtual reality robot 
there it's a um and this is a little bit of a spoiler uh but there's a there's a story in there called faster gun which is told from the point of view of doc holiday except what you may eventually realize if you're reading closely is that it's not actually doc holiday it's a virtual simulation of doc holiday um who is a non-player character in a virtual reality game um who is just on the edge of achieving consciousness and keeps getting rebooted <laughs> to start the start the scenario over again yeah. um, I, I I hope someday he makes it. <laughs> Although that might Doc Holliday, the uh, the supercomputer might be like Moriarty, the supercomputer. That might not be the best idea ever. Well, you know, then then you know, my favorite of the virtual reality agents is is Agent Smith. I mean, I when I first saw the Matrix, I leaned over to my husband. I said, "Oh, it'd be so cool if you were a software agent." Yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like and he yeah, is. He is. <laughs> <laughs> No, Robin, you're supposed to be reading, rooting for Keanu Reeves. It's like, no, no, I must root for my home tribe here, you know? No, I, yeah, no, I'm totally on board. So if they're doing a best of, Elizabeth Bear, are you going to do a second best of collection? <laughs> or, uh, you know, it's like, you never see collections like, the worst of. So the worst of Elizabeth Bear. No, I, I mean, uh, maybe, in, uh, maybe in another 15 or 20 years, <laughs> I'll have new stories for a second best of. But these are... These the award winners and my personal favorites but that's long to put on a book cover um, yeah it, it is i think that um forget some i think maybe it was connie willows who did, did these are my favorite stories or some yeah together you know things like that so mm -hmm. before we go i wanted to touch base uh your uh your new book that just came out earlier this in the spring, Ancestral Nights. That's got a yes. sentient AI in it. Who I guess is also technically a robot because he's a ship mind. Yeah. Kind of kind of sounded Ian Banky-ish, culture-ish. There's a there's a little Ian Banks in there. I mean the the um the idea of the ship mind, the 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 um the artificial intelligence embodied in a spaceship goes way back in science fiction. I think it's probably like the second thing anybody thought of once we came up with artificial intelligences. Um, and I'm not enough of a historian of that. You need John Clute right now to, to tell you who the first one who did it was. But um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely a Banksian influence. Um, I was very interested in in writing the and the book I mentioned earlier, Machine, is also set in that universe. So there are more ship mines in that one, and the AI embodied in an android. Um, the uh, she's she's basically uh, Clippy the paperclip, and oh good, everybody starts off hating her <laughs> for some odd reason. Yeah. For some odd reason, it would be the paperclip trapped in a sex spot. It's just, it was the yeah. worst thing I could think of. Um, that, is, that is terrible. <laughs> the, uh, so um, those books arose because I wanted to, actually I wanted to talk about uh, government as, to, as a technology. Um, and it seems very interesting to me that we keep writing these space operas, these far flung, far future science fiction novels with vast tracts of land and enormous amounts of technology. And they all seem to either be republics or empires. And, um, you know, every so often you have like, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, what, uh, my friend Max Gladstone's term for the Ian Banks uh, governmental system is luxury space communism, which I think is great. Yeah, that is a that's a great way to do that. That yeah, post scarcity so, type approach. Yeah, so I wanted to to show a post scarcity world, but also like dig into a little bit into set what some of the governmental systems are, and how they make it work, and how decision making is handled in this vast huge multi-species world you know world universe um where they still even even with uh, faster than like travel they still have enormous time lags and communication like, how do you do that um and a lot of it has to do with um uh people being grown-ups <laughs> 
<laughs> but much, much better neuroscience. <laughs> That makes it fictional, right? We're expecting yes. everybody to, to do adulting, huh? Yeah, yeah. No, they, they have better better science of adulting, but <laughs> um, which is a source of conflict in the novel, actually. And uh, the the AI, the, the ship mind in that is named Singer, and he is one of my favorite characters that I have ever written. Um, he's very sarcastic. And uh, we're in the murder bot land. Oh. Which I love, <laughs> he's right? not. The, he's not that sarcastic. He oh. likes his job. <laughs> he likes his job a lot. He's just. Oh, murder bot does sort of. I mean, <laughs> right? murder murder bot is relatable because murder bot is a working stiff with, you know, like five gig economy jobs who just wants to lie around on the couch at the end of the day, and binge watch TV. Murder bot is all of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't tell, I devoured those books. Like, oh, oh hell yeah! I've got a picture of uh, Martha in my lab with all the robots a a around her from my lab, and she's oh. reading to them like she's they're in kindergarten. You know? Oh my god! It's such a cute photo. I am I am so pleased with the success of those books. Um, I mean, not only are they delightful, and Martha is delightful, but she's wait she's done her time in the trenches you know um she's been an excellent writer for 15 20 years now 20 years got to be at least um so i'm just thrilled <laughs> and isn't it funny how the little things what clicks and what doesn't what catapults yeah. her to fame with you know is, took her and everybody by surprise right this little mm -hmm. sort of toss it out and yeah uh, you know, just, just nailed it beautifully. So I, you know, love murder bots. Yay. Well, speaking of favorite robots, as we, as we wrap up, what is, who, what is your favorite robot, um, fictional or real, but it can't be Singer, Kelsindi, or Dolly? <laughs> well, it can't be any of my robots. That basically. Would... Yeah, basically. That's okay. I'm, I'm ruling those out. I mean, I know you love yours. You already said Singer was your favorite, but still. <laughs> um. Oh, you know, I have an enormous soft spot for the Iron Giant. Oh my gosh, isn't that that worked out really well as a movie too? Oh God, that that movie is just amazing, a, a un, unrecognized classic of the genre. I think it's final. People are finally starting to realize how good it is. Yeah, um, yeah and it was Ted Hughes had written it, who was Sylvia Plath's husband. Uh, you know, I so did that, not they, know yeah, that. and it was it was I think it I think it's Brad Bird's first film before he got in with Disney. Kind of the no look, yeah, I it can is. really do good stuff. Really, see, this is more sophisticated. I got to see him do a talk about it. Um, oh, lucky you! Was it was it at Convergence? It was this past. It was last year, I think it was 2018, and he was going into the details of like how they did, like. Um, animation decisions and anyway it was yes it was fantastic um <laughs> all right so you passed the test on the question you know oh excellent okay really, what's the I failing mean, what's the failing answer i, I don't I, you know is i don't know i hate robots but you know so that's, <laughs> so, and i love it it's kind of like asking people their favorite robot and then they think really hard it's like it's it's like the monty python you know blue no yellow it's like you, no one knows. I've got five others lined up. If you rejected that one, exactly. Oh, you've got backup so, plans. We have plans. Yeah, I have. Plans. I have backup we robots. Have plans, you know. I'm from the '80s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have backup robots. Well, very cool. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. And please, please, please write more stories with robots in them. And in the meantime. I can do that. Great. In the meantime, everybody, if you're not subscribing to uh, Robotics Through Science Fiction podcast and our YouTube channel and our newsletter, please do so so you won't miss a thing.